Thank you very much. Very grateful uh, to be part of Black Lawrence Press. Grateful to be here tonight. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to read um, some micros, micro fiction from translated from the original One Inch Punch fiction. This first one's called Free Verse Departure. Poets bring nothing to the party. They don't even ask. They show up on time or late. They get lost. They say they're coming, but don't. They arrive in time for food, stand in a corner and drink, never take off their coat. They'll strip to a t-shirt, talk about bird, things you've never heard as Parker plays on your Alexa. Sometimes poetry breaks out. Someone picks up a guitar. There's action on the roof. Shy cats come out of hiding. An enormous radish gets carved into art. Memory floats up from an afternoon in Oaxaca, 1984. The houseboat rises, warms, and then everyone leaves all at once in a free verse departure, sink full of dishes, someone leaves a hat, and the night itself becomes a poem. And guess what? That's what the poets brought. Free verse departure. We probably all remember family vacations, car vacations, and depending on how long the trip was, sometimes they weren't vacations. This one's called Turn on the AC. Traveling cross country, we were four kids, plus a friend, a mom, a dad, a grandma, and a dog in the family Falcon wagon with our luggage strapped on top and a canvas bag of water stretched across the grill. Dad sat behind the wheel with his twitches and ticks and maylocks, dreaming of a galaxy with four on the floor and a beehive blonde named Nadine in a bucket seat beside him. His life a country western song, Devil Woman specifically. Somewhere near Odessa on the way to Huntsville, someone realized they'd left me back at the Stuckies where we'd stop for gas and date shakes. They had to turn around. I imagine some debate arose from whoever had taken my seat in the way back. Mom scolding dad, Susie, the old collie looking worried and grandma stoic, her mind 60 years back, jumping off the train in the middle of the night, middle of nowhere to get away from the old German. I had watched them load up and leave without me as I ducked behind the Frito stand. I hated dates. I ordered my own chocolate shake, feeling rich with the fiber I'd saved from collecting bottles and looking back towards California where I figured my thumb could take me. As I waited by the interstate for a Camaro or maybe a Nova with AC and more legroom going my way. <laughs> I was turned on the AC. This next piece, it's about 350 words. It's called Evan's Essence. I visited my friend Evan at the VA, found him in bed, smiling, wearing baggy flannels, asked how he was doing. Oh, fine, he said, like it was last year or five years ago or 15 or 20. I poured him a glass of water, noticed his left hand was gone. We played checkers until he started yawning. I promised to return. The next day he was still in flannels, but these were blue and red checked, soft and comfy, just like Smile and Ev. His big brown eyes were even bigger behind thick glasses he now wore. His feet were gone, kept it to myself. We played checkers, talk baseball with the Giants repeat as champs, this being an odd year. Superstitious, like any old player, Ev shrugged, grinned his Cheshire grin, and drifted off. I couldn't get to the VA for three days. When I entered his room, Evan smiled, gone from the chest down now, covers pulled up around his neck. We skipped checkers and baseball, he asked about the kids. Typical Evan. He was doing this his way. Didn't stop me from crying. Don't be sad, Kenny. You're seeing the best of me. There's no time to complain about Lincecum's curveball or worry about who owes who money, which made me wonder whether I'd repaid that five spot when we went to see on any Sunday 
in eighth grade. We talked motorcycles. I reminded him how he'd had his helmet and gloves before he ever had his first bike. And Evan chuckled, always wanted to be ready. Saturday evening, his nurse Shangri-La nodded gently and showed me to his room. I stared at rumpled covers, saw his smile on the pillow below, below those glasses. His lips moved. I edged closer, wondering if he was confessing his love for Shangri-La or admitting that he had finished my stool in woodshop, helping me graduate on time. Or perhaps he was imparting a universal secret, being the most agile spiritual explorer I ever knew. And I think he whispered, love's the current upon which we ride. His smile faded, Evan vanished, and his essence filled the room. The monitor flashed, Shangri-La threw back the curtains, outside the wind blew, slender palms bent back and forth as if waving goodbye. A shooting star arced a silver trail across the satin sky. Somewhere, a baby beckoned, and Shangri-La slipped away to complete her rounds. That was Evan's essence. This next story, well, we all have editors. We have complicated relationships sometimes with editors, especially when they're a cat. This one's called In So Many Words. You're in for a hard rewrite, says Pierre the cat. Metaphorically, I ask, like with this poem or life? For clarification, he walks across my chest, licks my earlobe with his sandpaper tongue, his paw catching on my flannel, as if that's supposed to clear things up. It's part of his craft, his editor's technique. Why so many words, he says, but it's not a question. He takes his time extricating himself from me, pinned in my favorite chair, coffee cup just out of reach. Then, with the pen, he settles across my journal in the typed first draft. When Pierre pulls out the pink fine point, adverbs tremble, adjectives pray. I've hidden the red, can you imagine? You wanna talk about craft, he says, try writing without any words, without paper. Try living next door to a beginning sax player who doesn't know the beauty of silence. Sometimes Pierre sees metaphor on a different frequency. He looks at me with unblinking yellow eyes. It takes discipline to write. It takes discipline not to write. You should try it sometime. He looks away, licks a spot he missed on his paw. Let's be clear on this, he says. If writing, rewriting is getting to know yourself all over again, then let me introduce the two of you. He yawns. Pierre's lost all vestiges of his feral origins, but he's a tough as nails editor. He leaves the manuscript, hops on top of me, licks his other paw, his chest, then starts to lick himself down, reaching places I never dreamed of. Are you showing off now, I ask? He stares at me, who knows what he sees. Those yellow eyes speak truth, wordless. That 60 grit tongue rounding odd corners, applying a smooth, fine finish, showing me how it's done. Can I at least refill my coffee cup, I ask, down to one free hand, my torso under siege. Not a big cat, a dainty killer in fact. Pierre somehow grows heavy on you. His purring, I take as a no. Pinned by exponential weight with his whiskers brushing against my cheek and tickling, I know better than to laugh. His sudden dismounts are four-claw affairs and sometimes draw blood. Editor's red, he calls it, his personal copy editing marks. Craft is physical. Catnip is for later. Eating grass is the best way to purge. Addition by subtraction. And purge you must, he says, eyeing my manuscript my words as he moves to the Istanbul rug and flexes his claws. Keep your claws sharp, commands Pierre, no one to stop. Work on your indifference. Don't just kill your little darlings, as your beloved Faulkner once said. Have a little fun with them. Bat them around. Scare the precious shit out of them. Pierre gazes out the window, his back to me, who knows what he sees. I once wrote a story, he says, and it went like this. Pierre walked the streets of Kathmandu. Dogs cowered in the shade. Pierre's walking still in the story. His tail flicks. Every story, every dream, every poem I've written since has been the same, retold. Meaning is a shadow you can't grasp. Pierre saunters into the kitchen, 
leaps onto the counter. Anything made smaller is better. Tumors, hairballs, palms. Remember, anything except breakfast. So, he growls. You got any king salmon in the house, writer? That, too, is not a question. And so I rise. And uh, I'll close with a very short little houseboat story. And it's called Short Walk on a Long Pier. Floating in the shadows of the ferry where a famous master once zenned, lived a sippy monk on a tippy barge called the China Sea. Each morning, he walked the planks with a satisfied stride, then untied cones of kelpie line until noon. At lunch, he played chess with the seagulls on a skiff, and when high tide arrived, he paddled to the no-name for beer and read Li Po until two. No books were written about him. No one came to his door. But his elegant wisdom glittered like sea glass on the ocean floor. Lifting a conch shell to his ear, he heard the whisper of the universe. And placing the shell to his lips, he answered its call. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.